you for coming and shedding your blood upon the cross, Father. You said that you came to save your people from their sin. So we thank you, Lord, for saving us from sin. Thank you for saving them from ourself, Lord. Help us to be single-eyed, single mind. Help us to lay it all down, Lord, and to just give you our hearts, our minds, everything, Lord. Because you said the things of this world are not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, Lord. The things we will go through, the things that we are tested and tried through, Lord. So help us to sell all that we have in our heart and our mind to give everything, Lord, to strip ourselves of those sins and those weights, those things which would so easily beset us, and help us to run with faith, hope, love, joy, peace, and endurance. The, the race is set before us, looking unto you, Jesus, who began it all and who are the finisher of our faith. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My title for my sermon is Jesus, My Everything. And it's a continuation of what I was talking about the last time, which is Jesus is my life. If you start in John 10, and we're going to be reading from verse 1 to 11, it says, Verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, or I'm going to get a point to you. He says, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. He says, This is a parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things which he had spoken unto them. So he, po he spoke unto them this parable, and his own disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. So he said, Then said Jesus unto them again, Truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He that entered in, all that ever, he says, whoops, <laughs> he says, I, all that ever came before me and thieves or robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. He says, all who would, who came before me and said they were the Messiah, they were the answer. He says, they're thieves and robbers. And we, we, he, we still see them today. People who say they're the way, they're the answer. People sometimes even in the church who instead of pointing to Christ, they point to themselves as if they're some great hero or some, you know, maybe they don't even do it, but people put people up on a pedestal and they say, well, this place, person is some great person of God and he's the answer and all these things they say. And instead of pointing to Jesus Christ, they're pointing to other things. And sometimes it's not even a person or themselves. Sometimes it's an idea. They, point, they can point to prayer and say, prayer is the answer. No, Jesus is the answer, and you're, talk, you're talking to Jesus. Prayer has nothing to do with it. Just That'd be like saying that you put all your hope in your talking, and you think by your talking you're going to, you know, make, you know everybody, everything's going to go away just because you can talk. And so we don't have any confidence in prayer, but our confidence is in Jesus. We don't have any confidence in fasting. People all the time talk about fasting. Well, is fasting a good thing? Yes. But what is fasting but setting yourself aside to seek Jesus Christ? You know, people talk about they make a doctrine out of um, many different things. You know, laying hands on the sick and praying for people. They, they, they have thought it above everything else. Well, who heals people? Jesus Christ. So when we're in Jesus, when Jesus is our everything, then we can heal people because Jesus did the same. You know, everything Jesus did, we can do. But if you have a friend, and the, a so-called friend, and the only reason you like that friend is because of something they do for you or something they own. When I was younger, I had a friend, and to tell you the truth, he wasn't really a friend, but he'd bring over computer games, and we had a computer. So he was a great friend. But that was the only reason I really wanted to see him. That's not a friend. And that's what people are with Christ. That's what people who think they are Christians. They, they, lo they love the healing message. They love the deliverance message. They love the prayer message. They love the fasting message. They love these things. But their love isn't in Jesus Christ because if you love a person, you love, you love who they are. You love everything about them. 
Now, I mean, with a normal person, you might love a person and they have something wrong with them and you don't love that part of them. There's nothing wrong with them. If, I mean, if this guy's got a really stupid sense of humor, his jokes aren't funny, you love the person, but you, you really don't like their sense of humor. There's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus is different. If you love Jesus, you love everything about him because that's who he is. You know, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And in the next verse, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And another side it says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And if you take those two scripture verses in context, think of it this way. He said to him, our hero Israel, our Lord, our God is one Lord. Why would he say he's one Lord? Because he's warnings, he's judgment, he's love, he's kindness, he's forgiveness, he's blessings, he's warnings, he's hope, he's the fear of the Lord. Everything God is, is God. You can't separate a portion of God and say, this is who God is. No, that's a, who, that's a portion of who he is. And that's where people in the church go wrong. And that's why you have so many, so many different uh, churches. You have Baptists, you have Presbyterians, you have Catholic. You have all these different movements because what happened? They got a portion of the truth. And instead of seeking, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, they became a Methodist, they became a Baptist, they became the, these different areas. They got a portion of the truth, but just like the, Jesus says, they came before me, they're thieves and robbers. What happens is they get a portion of Christ, and that, and that becomes their answer. Jesus isn't their answer. They're, what they were is their answer. What they do is their answer. What they pray is their answer. What they fast is their answer. And we hear, you know, 101 ways to, to, to seek God, and it's all this, this, this. The Bible says, seek me with all your heart, and you will find me. We complicate things, or we cut off portions of the scripture, and we say, that's the answer. No, Jesus is our answer. Everything Christ is, there's, there's the answer. Jesus himself, his righteousness, his peace, his joy, his kindness, his gentleness, his forgiveness, his warnings, his truth. His, you know, laying hands on the sick and they will recover. You know, preaching the truth in love. You know, uh, warning the, 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 uh, the Pharisees of their hypocrisy. All these things were Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He says, without me you have no life. He says, I am the bread of life which cometh from heaven. If a man eat thereof, he shall live and not die. But we... As humans, we have this habit of getting a hold of a portion of something and leaving what we don't like. It's like having a smorgasbord in front of us. And we'll, eat, we'll gladly eat this food. We'll gladly eat this food. But let's not touch that nasty vegetable. Let's not touch that food that our, you know, we don't know why our parents keep on cooking, but we don't like it. But we treat God like that. We treat Jesus Christ like that. Instead of saying, he's my everything and everything he is, is mine, we'll take the blessings but we won't take the warnings. We'll take the grace of God, not realizing that the grace of God is the life of Jesus Christ flowing in you to form his very nature and his character and his image in us. So we'll take a portion of Christ, but we don't want all of it. That's the flesh. I mean, the flesh doesn't want, the flesh doesn't want to work to gain something. The flesh is more than that. That's why people fall off their get-rich creams, because they want money, but they don't want to work for it. And it's the same way in the church. People will gladly fall for something that's simple and easy, but they don't want the work involved. That's why they said we're saved by, you know, they, they quote the scripture verse, we are not saved by works, we're saved by grace. Well, then it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I say it's like this. You know, and the Bible says that they will be cleansed and that they may be a vessel meet for the master's use. So Jesus wants to cleanse us of everything that's not right, and he wants us to be a, a beautiful vessel that can be used in the kingdom for his glory, that can do his work, that can lay hands on the sick, that can take care of the poor, that can visit the widows and their afflictions, that can, you know, that can help the orphans, that can be persecuted for the righteous sake, and people can look in and say, look at the persecution they're putting up with, and the love and the grace of God comes out of them, I got to know this person who's changed their life. 
In other words, to where we become like Christ, no matter what we go through, and they see Christ in us, and they've got to know Christ because they've never seen somebody like this before. And he says, but he, okay, then she just, she just, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. He says, I am the answer. I am your everything. Everything else is a distraction. He says, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He says, if you enter in, did you notice he just didn't say enter in and you'll be saved? But he says, you'll go in and out and you'll find pasture. You know, Psalms 34 talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, you know, he leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in path of righteousness for his namesake. If you take that whole thing, he talks about peace. He talks about joy in restoring your soul. He talks about righteousness. He talks about the rod and the staff. He talks about correcting you, but protecting you and leading you and guiding you. He talks about providing your needs, you know, lays a table out before you in the presence of your enemies. And he talks about his goodness and his mercy for all. So it talks about all the, who God is in that one section of scripture. And he says, so I want, not only am I the way into salvation, but I am the way in and out as you, I lead you through this life to where you will find what you need and you will know what's right. So Jesus is not only our salvation, he is our life. He is our everything. He's supposed to lead us and guide us into righteousness, lead us and guide us into peace, lead us and guide us into joy. And that's why it says, if your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, if your eyes are on Jesus, your heart and your mind is stayed on him, you'll have joy, you'll have grace, you'll have peace, you'll have life. But if your eyes are only on partly on Jesus, well, the devil is more than happy to take that part that isn't in Jesus and put it in something else. And you will stumble and you will fall and great will be the darkness. Have you ever wondered how all of a sudden you get your eyes off Jesus and you get yourself on something and all of a sudden darkness wells up and despair wells up in you. All these things start going wrong in your life. It's like instant. I don't know about you, but there's times I'm seeking God and all of a sudden somebody, something distracts me and I get the wrong attitude or I go pursue something that I shouldn't and all of a sudden, bam! All of a sudden it's dark instantly. It's misery instantly. It's, you know, it's hell on earth instantly. The reason is because Christ is heaven. Christ is our life. He's our everything. And because we are in a war zone. If you're in a war zone and you've got a general who's leading you and he knows where you need to go to win that battle and get you out safely, if you get distracted from the general, if you get distracted from the captain, whoever you're following, and you're behind enemy lines, you get distracted for a second, you wander off, all of a sudden you step on a landmine, all of a sudden you get behind, all of a sudden you get surrounded by the enemy, and the devil is surrounding us, him and his demons surround us, and people get caught up in the devil and the demons and all these things. Well, yes, they're out to destroy you, but we're only supposed to be caught up in one thing, and that's Jesus Christ, because you will follow, and your feet naturally, naturally, when your eyes go one direction, your body wants to wander that direction. If your eyes are on Jesus, your heart and your life will go that direction. But if your eyes are on something else, your heart and your mind will go that direction. And if you don't, if you got your eyes on one thing and you're trying, you know, at one thing and you're still trying to walk forward, then you're double-minded. You're unstable in all your ways. And that's when people trip up. That's when all of a sudden they're out, out of left field. They're, something goes really wrong. And yes, the devil can send stuff at us. Yes, sickness and all this. But a lot of the things that happen in our life is because of something we've done. Because our eyes are on Christ. Because we're not trusting in him, not rejoicing in him. You know, it says all good things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Or you could say it this way. All things work together for those who have their eyes and their heart and mind stayed on him and are pursuing Jesus Christ. Because if we're not, then we're pursuing something else. And the devil, he'll trip us up. He'll, rip, he'll, he'll tear us a new one. He'll do all these things to us. And he says, Jesus said unto them, he says, if you, I am the door, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for the steal, to kill, and destroy. He says, if you listen to me, if you follow me, he says, you'll have life. I'll lead you and guide you. But the devil's there, ready to destroy you. And he says, I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundant. He says, I have come that you might have a life of holiness, of peace, and of joy, of the fruit of the Spirit. He says, I have come that you might, 
you know, be able to love the person who spits in your face, that you might be able to forgive that person who wrongs you, that you might be able to have patience no matter what's going around you, that you might be able to endure, that, you know, that the life of God will flow through you. And it says, you know, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that Christ might be the center of your heart, the center of your mind, the center of what you live for, and that you may be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, a love for God because he first loved you, a love his love shed abroad in your heart for others. And he says, you may know the height, the depth, the width, that you might know of the truth. And, that, and then he says that you may know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. If our hearts and our minds are stayed on him, then that abundant life will come forth, that consumed, possessed with Jesus will come forth. That's why you had the disciples who could, you know, they would pass by people and the shadow would heal people. That's why they could hear God's voice and they would know where to go. That's why there was like, you know, they would be transported from one location to another because they were filled with Jesus. And where can we see another sign of why they were used of God so mightily? When they sold all they had and gave it, laid it at the disciples' feet, and then what the disciples did with it? Right afterwards, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. In other words, we didn't take any of it. We don't have any money. Their whole life was in Jesus, and it was, it was exemplified because... They didn't care about stuff. It wasn't because they didn't care about stuff that they were right with God. They loved God, therefore they didn't care about stuff. As they gave themselves, as Christ became resurrected in their life, as Christ was crucified and their heart and their life was broken of what they wanted. Because before that, they all wanted to be rulers in the kingdom. But after that, they said, Jesus, you gave your life. You are our life. You are everything. They were broken over what they wanted by the cross. And then they saw Christ resurrected in their heart. And all of a sudden, Christ became their everything. And then all of a sudden, they sought him. They waited upon him. They, they cried out to him. And then 40 days later, the power of God hit them. And all of a sudden, they lay hands on the poor. They, I mean, they lay hands on the sick, and they recovered. They spoke new tongues. They did all these things. And then you saw that after that, they sold everything. But because Christ became their everything, everything came forth from it. When our eyes are on Christ, we become filled with his light. When our hearts and minds stay on him, it says, blessed is the man, he says, if, thy mind, if you keep, how does it say that exactly? He says, if you keep your mind upon him, great peace have they, okay. God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. If our heart and our mind are stayed on Christ, then we will have great peace. If we rejoice in the Lord, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he will give us the desires of our heart. Because the Lord knows what desires there are good, but the devil's always trying to plant desires that aren't good. Cares, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things. It's like the parable with the, the, you know, there was the grains and there was the tares. Now he was talking about people who are, look right but aren't right, and then people who are right. But you could also take this as an example in our lives. Sometimes God plants good seed in our life, and all of a sudden it'll spring forth. But then the devil will come and plant other thoughts, other dreams, other desires. You know, you're going down the road as a guy, and all of a sudden there's this really awesome-looking sports car. And all of a sudden the devil just plants this desire, and, oh, I've got to have that sports car. Oh, it seems, it seems simple, but it's still mammon, it's still distraction, it's still fleshly, and we don't need it. And that's just an example of what the devil does. He'll plant desires and thoughts and dreams in our heart that have no meaning, that don't, that will, even worse, they'll bring destruction. You'll get a hold of that car, a hold of that thing, and all of a sudden it'll drain you financially, and all of a sudden you're like, man, why did I ever buy these things? The devil wants to plant stuff in our heart and our mind that will eat away at the life of God. You know, if you can, you can be on fire for the Lord, reading his word, and all of a sudden you sit down and you watch something, and all of a sudden your joy's gone, your love's gone, your hope's gone, and all of a sudden it's just, there's even stuff out there that's supposedly Christian you watch, and all of a sudden your life goes out of you. Because it, it, doesn't, exa it doesn't exalt Jesus. It doesn't keep your heart and your mind on him, but it gets your heart and your mind on something else. And the devil will gladly plant something else in there. And he says, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Or he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, you don't have to worry. He says, I will provide for you. I will lead you. I will guide you. The devil will try to tell you you need Jesus and. You know, that's why people don't come to church. 
they say, well, I ain't got time, or I can do it on my own. What they're really saying, and they don't realize it, is that Christ, I don't need any more of Christ. My job's enough. This is enough. I'm enough. Their confidence is in anything else but in Jesus Christ. And he said, Jesus says, I am your life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In him we live, move, and have our being. He says, you can find your hope, your joy, your, your, your patience, your sanity. You can find everything in me. But he says, because I prove it. I give my life for you. He says, Jesus, he said, the Father says, if I freely gave my own son for you, how much more shall I not also freely give you all things? So he says, if you are single-eyed, if you follow me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you want, and the Father will give it to you. In other words, he says, if you live in me, he says, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will nourish you, I will provide everything you need. He says, I am the way, I am your answer. But the devil will try to get you to follow other ways, try to get you to follow other desires. I mean, it doesn't really, you know, if you really sat down someday, and maybe you should, write down the things that the devil has distracted you by. Okay? Money. Um, a book. A movie. Sports. A car. Just write down the things that the devil has distracted you with in the past. And they, you know, they, they, like I said, they don't seem obvious at the beginning. They don't seem like they're deadly. But they, they lead to destruction. Because we've all, heard, we've all seen it, or maybe even been guilty of it, when you're coming to church on fire of the Lord, and all of a sudden, they don't show up one day for service. But they still show up for other services. And all of a sudden, it goes on for a couple months. All of a sudden, they're no longer coming to another service. But they're still coming at least once a Sunday. And all of a sudden, a month down the line, they don't come to church at all. You call them up and says, well, I'm so busy. We got a new house. We got a new car. Well, you know, our kids are in sports. Or, you know, we can watch you on TV. Or we can watch you on the Internet. What do you think the devil's doing? He's distracting you. He's leading you astray so he can devour you. That's what the devil's after. That's what the flesh is after. We all think that, you know, I can plant this little bit of seed of sin. I can plant this little bit of flesh, and it won't hurt us. And believe me, I've been guilty of it as anybody else. You know, it doesn't seem obvious sometimes, but it will destroy you. It will harm you. And Jesus says, that's why Jesus said that the Hebrew children in the wilderness, he says, they had, he, you know, he says, I am the living bread which cometh down from heaven, and a man may eat thereof and not die. Not as your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. But that was an example of Christ. They were supposed to learn that the manna, or the word of God, or Jesus himself, because the manna is the word, the living word. The, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. And, you know, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They said, in other words, Jesus was the word made flesh and made dwelling among us. Jesus was an example of what the word was saying, and he is the word. So anything in the Bible, Jesus did. That's why when the devil tempted, he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus lived and eat and breathed the word of God. And he says, I, the things I speak, I only heard of my father. You know, people say, well, look what Jesus said. Well, if you look in the Old Testament, you can find the things that Jesus said in the Old Testament. But Jesus spoke the heart of God in a more understandable way to the people. And he says, I am the answer. Now that I'm here, the word can become alive to you because I am the word made flesh. And he says, so he says that the, the Hebrew children were supposed to learn that they needed God and God alone and his word alone. And that's what we are supposed to learn to where Christ is our life. His word is our life. That's Jesus is all we need. His word is all we need. But the flesh and the devil will kick and scream and holler that you need all kinds of other things. But that's where we need to learn that our eyes and our heart and our mind are supposed to be stayed upon Christ. It, the devil will try anything and everything he can. It, you know, he really doesn't care what it is. He doesn't even care if it, you know, he'll even use religious things. You know, uh, like I said, fasting or other things. It doesn't matter how he gets our eyes off of Jesus Christ. But if our heart and our mind are on Jesus, we're open for deception. We're open to be distracted. We're open to be led astray. And he says, Psalms 23, 1 through 6, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What won't you want? 
You won't want those sin in the world because Christ has set you free. You won't want, you won't want, you know, you know, that says, don't worry, the Father knows what you, that you have need of clothes and, you know, your needs met. You won't want those things because you just say, Lord, I need this and I trust in you and thank you, it's done. You won't want that which is good because he says he won't, uphold, he won't hold back anything good from you. He says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him because he that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he says, they will not want. They will not want that which is wrong. They won't need, want that which is need. And they won't want that which is right in a sense because I will give it to them gladly. If you follow the shepherd, if your heart and your mind are on Jesus, he will give you all good things. And he says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He'll make you rest in a place of growth, a place of comfort, a place of, you know, having all your, what you need met. He says, he leadeth me beside the still waters, a place of pure water that isn't muddy, that isn't, you know, you don't get, you don't feel like when you're listening to a sermon sometimes, you're like, oh, that's good, and oh, that's not good. That's not what Jesus is. That's not the word is. He'll give you pure water. He'll give you pure life. Jesus doesn't give you some joy and then give you some bitterness. He doesn't give you hope and then despair. He doesn't give you righteousness, but then excuses for your sin. He doesn't do these things. He says, I will lead you behind the, the clear water. He says, a water that's deep. You know, a, a, a low-level creek will bubble. And sometimes that's who we are. We're, we're bubbling. We're bubbly. We're bubbly. Okay? But we're not deep because when something goes wrong, we fall apart. And, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't despair when that happens and say, Lord, lead me to deeper waters because sometimes, um, you know, uh, I get a little stagnant. I get a little messed up. And he says, so, he says, I will lead you to a place of deep waters, of cleansing waters, of life-giving waters, of peaceful waters. And he says, he restoreth my soul. And sometimes when you're fighting a battle, when you're fighting things, all of a sudden, you, you get weary and faint. He says, be not wearied and faint, but look unto Jesus, the author, and finish your faith. He says, I will restore you. I will give you grace. I will give you peace. I will give you a strength that will not stumble, that will not fall. He says, I'll make you like the eagles. You know, you'll soar above everything. You'll run and not grow weary. You'll walk and not faint. Those who seek me, who put their heart and their mind on me, they will do these things. And he says... He says, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He will lead you. If your eyes are on Christ, he'll lead you into righteousness. If what you're following isn't leading you into righteousness, then you need to question what you're following. Okay, if you're listening to, if you're reading a book and it's leading you into covetousness, then it isn't God. If it's leading you into fear and worry, that's why you shouldn't get caught up in the news, because it'll lead you into fear and worry and anxiety. If, you know, if you're, if you're reading something and all of a sudden wrong desires are welling up in your side, it's not beca you know, because they're feeding, you're putting something in there and there, there's something wrong in there and it feeds wrong desires. Well, then it ain't of God. That's why he says, put nothing wicked in front of your eyes. He says, that's why David, in the, you know, he says, I will put nothing wicked in front of my eyes. I hate the works of them to turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. He says, I hate vanity. He says, but, my, but thy word do I love. Because David had an understanding that his life was in Christ. His life was in the word. And he didn't even want anything foolish. He didn't even want anything vanity. And Jesus says that there will come a day when man will turn aside to vanity, to fables, and they'll have itching ears. In this modern day, people, we love fantasy. We love stories. We love falsehoods. We love, you know, you know, we get our enjoyment, our life out of these things. And Jesus says, no, I want, my word is more real than anything else. You need to be consumed with me. You need to abide in me. My word needs to abide in you. You need to, it says, don't even let the word depart from your eyes. Don't hide it in the midst of your heart. It says it should be bind for a sign upon thine hand. In other words, and everything you put your hand to and says, is this in the word? Is this bringing honor and glory to God? As, as things beside your eyes, you know, like the horses, you know, they're, sometimes when they're racing, they'll get distracted. So they put the binders on their eyes because they've got to keep their eyes towards the finish line. And the word of God is supposed to be things on our eyes to where our eyes are on Jesus and nothing else. Our eyes aren't on ourselves. Because then we will stumble and fall and we won't go anywhere because, we'll, you know, we're a mess without Christ. But we will acknowledge where we're wrong, but then we'll look to Christ and say, Lord, you are holy, you are righteous. Therefore, I acknowledge this is wrong and I repent 
And then I look to you to overcome it. I'm going to, that's why, you know, Paul says, I press towards the mark. He says, I, I, he says, I'm not looking back at how I used to be some head honcho over the Pharisees. He says, I'm not looking back at all the things I used to do. He says, but what I love, what I desire is Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dung. Because his heart and his mind had been consumed, possessed with Jesus Christ. And we've seen that with certain, you know, if you see somebody in life when they're driven by something, let's say they're, they're driven by Olympics or they're driven by their work, you can talk to them about other things and their, their eyes glaze over, their ears glaze over. You know they're not listening to you because they are possessed, consumed with one thing and one thing only. And that's who we are supposed to be. Our eyes and our minds and our hearts are supposed to be consumed with Jesus Christ to where if somebody's trying to talk to us about something that's not right, our heart and our mind are consumed with Christ. And it's like throwing, throwing something at a bonfire. You know, if you throw, if you throw something at a, a really hot fire, it gets consumed by the fire. It, the fire isn't going to be affected by stuff. You know I mean, you can even get a fire so hot that you can hit, hit it with water and it'll still burn. Because one of these raging forest fires, they got to fight it, they got to dig trenches, they got to do all these things. And when our heart and our mind are consumed with Jesus Christ, the devil will try to do trenches to distract us. We'll try to raise up other fires because that's the one way they put out with fires. They raise other fires and put and send them against each other to try to eat the oxygen or the, the, the you could say the life out of the fire. And that's what the devil does. He tries to raise other fires in our heart and our life to where we're coming, when we're burning for Christ, all of a sudden this other fire will come you know, a fire of anger, a fire of bitterness, a fire of lust, whatever it is, and all of a sudden it eats the oxygen out of the, out of the environment, and all of a sudden both fire, your fire is snuffed out. And that's also the truth. As you feed Christ, other fires in your life, things that aren't right, will be consumed. But you've got to be consumed with Jesus. Your heart and your mind have got to be filled with him. You've got, you've got to be single-eyed. Your heart and your mind have got to be stayed on him. You've got to rejoice and delight in Jesus Christ alone. And he says... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, though I walk through a place of darkness and where I would despair. I could all, you could also say it this way. Even though I'm walking through a place where I'm dying to everything I used to think was important. But it's not true death. Because true death is when you end up in hell. But it's a shadow of death. Because all these things are burning off your life that aren't important anymore. That don't mean anything. But they used to be very important to you. He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He says, for thou art with me. He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. When your heart and your mind are on him, Jesus never leaves us or forsake us. But sometimes we think he does because we've either forsaken him or we've gotten our heart and our mind off of him. You know, it's like there's a light in front of us and we get our eyes off the light and all of a sudden, you know, we get blinded or dar darkened by something, and then we try to find the light, and it's, you know, because it's, you know, sometimes the light seems far away, but it's still there, and if you get your eyes on something else, sometimes your eyes have to adjust, and they have to find that light in front of you again, and he says, you won't leave us, so he says, I don't fear anything, because my heart and my mind are stayed on you, and he says, because you're my shepherd, because you lead me, because you guide me, my life is in Christ, and that's what David had an, an understanding of, and he says, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He says, you correct me. Yes. But he says, I, don't, I love those. He says, I, he says, I, I whip and score. You know, he says, I chastise those I love. He says, because of your love, you whip me. And he says, therefore, your, your staff, it comforts me. And he says, your rod, you know, where they'd scoop up the sheep out of dark place, you know, he'd protect them and he'd fight off the animals or whatever. He says, you comfort me, you lead me, you guide me. And he says, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He says, you lead me. You, forgot, you provide everything. He says, thou anointest my head with oil. In other words, you fill me with your spirit. And he says, my cup runs over. He says, I have great joy in you. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John 10, 14 through 15 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so... No, I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He says, he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, those who are my sheep, they hear my voice. They know me, and they follow me. And he says, I've known the heart of the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
He says the Father, you know, he says he reigns on the unjust and on the just. You know, he gives good things to everyone. So he says, as the Father is, so am I. And as Jesus is, so are we supposed to be in this world. That's why it says, you know, love your enemies. Do good to those who, per, you know, who do evil to you. You know, forgive those who wrong you. And he says that you may be your children of the Father which is in heaven. And he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep as Christ laid his down, life down for us. And he proved that he is worthy of our life. So we lay our life down for him. You know, in a war sometimes, there's, there, if, in, if you look in history, there was some leaders that people would gladly lay their life down for because they knew that leader had their best interest at heart. They knew that if they let, followed that leader, they, I mean, if you study history, there's some people who they followed those leaders through hell and high water. Well, Christ is a greater leader than any you could ever find in history. I mean, you, if you see what some of these people were willing to go through for their hero or for the person that was leading them, how much more should we go through for Christ who gave his very soul for us, who gave his heart and his mind, who gave everything upon the cross, who took our sickness, our illness, our sin upon his back. And he says, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He says, if Jesus died for you all, then you must realize that you were dead. In other words, if he wouldn't have died for you, you would have died. He says, therefore, you were already dead. He says, if you know, if if you know, if you had this this thing and you were you would accidentally killed someone, and somebody stood up in your family and said, I will take his place on the electric chair, because you were already dead, because the judgment was against you, and that's what happens with sin. We were dead. Okay, sin separated us from God. Sin would cause our death, and Jesus said. They're already dead. I am going to give my life for them. And this is what it says. He says, because we just judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He says, you were dead in trespass and sins. You were dead in this world. He says, and he, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And sometimes I think we need to just cry out and say, Lord, you died for me. Therefore, Give me a revelation of that. Give me a revelation of what you, the price you paid, because, Lord, I know you are worthy. You've made me, therefore I am yours. You know, if I make a watch, I make something, it's mine. God made us. We are his. It says, the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. So we are already God's. We belong to him because he made us. You mean the flesh might scream out, the mind might scream out, I don't belong to anybody, I'm my own person. Well, Jesus said, whoever you yield yourself to a servant to obey, you're a slave to obey. I mean, if you yield yourself to alcohol, it'll consume you. Yield, whatever you yield yourself to, you'll become a servant of. So if you yield yourself to God, you're a servant. But if you yield yourself to something, you're going to yield and you're going to serve something. Don't let the devil or the world tell you otherwise. You know, people go on and on about freedom, about choice, about all these things. But what are they yielding themselves to? Okay, these people, you know, they, they say choice. Freedom of choice, pro-choice, so they can kill their child. But what happens to the mother afterwards? What happens to their body? Talk to these ladies. They're, 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 they're tormented because of the, the abortion. Or people who says, I want freedom of choice. I am going to go drink. All of a sudden, their life is destroyed by drinking. All of a sudden, you've got a community. We want gambling in our community. We want freedom of choice. We want, we want to do what we want to do. And all of a sudden, their lives are destroyed. You know, they lose everything. There's, there's millionaires or billionaires even who are on streets of Las Vegas because they gambled it all away. They had a choice, but they, they became a slave of the thing which they thought which was a good time. So what you yield yourself to, you will become a slave of. And he says, but we belong to Christ. Christ has bought us with his blood. So our heart and our life belong to him. And we need to say, Lord, you gave your life. Help us to have a revelation of the price you paid. Help us to give our life in return because the flesh and the devil will kick and scream and holler at you to, that you, to keep certain things. You know, Achan, he, he took the, the thing of gold and he put it under his tent and it caused the death of his whole family. And the reason why God did that 
is an example because we hide, people hide stuff in their life. They hide a little bit of angerness. They hide a little perversion. They hide a little bit of this. They hide a little bit of that. And it seems small, but it grows and it eats and it pollutes and it corrupts. And all of a sudden you find out 10 years down the line when the whole family's broken up, this person's over here, this person's over here, this person's in jail. It started with a single seed. It started with a single decision. And gee, that's why Jesus says, I've given my life for you. All I ask is my, you, you to give me your life in return. Because he says, you will be a slave. He says, I want to lead you out of this darkness. I want to lead you out of this world. But he says, you've got to follow me. You've got to be single-eyed. You've got to keep your heart and your mind on me. Or the devil will lead you astray. And he says, that they should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. John eleven twenty one through 26 and 39 through 44. And says, Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whosoever thou wilt ask of God, whatever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, he says he will rise again, and he, he will not see death. He, shall, he says, though he's dead, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He says, your brother is dead. You were dead in sin. You were dead in doubt. You were dead in despair. You were dead in drugs. You were dead in these areas. Sin had had you bound. But he says, if you look to Christ, he says, I am the resurrection of life. Don't let the devil speak to you and say, well, I'm involved in this. I'm doing this. Or my feelings or my emotions or my mind or, you know, I don't have a hunger for God. I don't desire to seek God with all my heart. Or, you know, I, I'm fighting it. There's this lethargic. The devil will try to make you lethargic. I don't know about you, but there's times in my life where the devil will just try to bring upon you this cloud, this lethargic where you don't feel like doing anything. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do anything. And that's when we need to look to Christ more because he says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what it seems. It doesn't matter even if you're in the grave. It doesn't matter if you're alive and there are areas of your life that aren't right, that are dead. He says, if you look to me, I will give you life. I will resurrect you. But he says, I've got to speak the word. You've got to hear my voice. And then he says, I, you, know, he, you know, if it goes on in our reading here and he talks about how he calls forth Lazarus and he calls him out of the grave, but there's still the grave clothes wrapped around him. And that's our life sometimes. We come forth from the grave, we come forth in the newness of life, but there's still things wrapped around our life that will stop us and hinder us, that it will, just, you know, that will cause us to rotten. But we've got to look to Jesus Christ, and he'll unwrap those things. He'll give us life, he'll give us hope, he'll give us joy, he'll give us peace. But the devil wants one thing and one thing only, and that is to get your heart and your mind off of something else than Jesus Christ. And that is all, that's his cry. He doesn't matter how he does it. I mean, we've all, you know, sometimes we think, well, man, I'm going through so much. Oh, you know, yeah, sometimes we are. But you know, the truth of the matter is that nothing, Jesus said there's nothing that we can go through that somebody else hasn't gone through already, that Jesus didn't go through. So we need to look to Christ and keep our hearts and our minds on him, and he will lead us, he will guide us, he will give us victory. And the devil sometimes, he's, a, he's like a little kid in the corner. Ah! He'll make so much racket, he'll scream, he'll holler, he'll do anything he, want, he can to try to distract you. But our heart and our mind need to stay on him. I mean, if you get your eyes off of Christ and heart off of Christ, and you have and you will, say, Lord, I'm sorry, and get your heart right, my, right back on him. Peter, he, he was walking over the water, and then he sunk because he got his eyes on what was going on around him. But at least he was smart enough to say, Jesus, help! How many of us have been dumb enough to say, I'm drowning, gah, 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 gah. nobody can help me, there's no hope, no victory, and we drown. We drown in despair, we drown in hopelessness, we drown in things that aren't right, because we don't look to Christ to overcome, we don't look to Christ to have victory. Yes, Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, he says, I'm trying to teach you to keep your heart and your mind stayed on me. Why did you doubt? Why did you take your eyes off me? Why did you take your mind off me? The whole time he was here on this earth, he was, saying, he was trying to teach the disciples that he was their life. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. 
he says, you know, and that's when some of the disciples got offended and they didn't walk away with them, walk with them anymore because they thought they had to have something else. They thought their life had to be in something else except Jesus Christ. But the disciples who followed him, they finally got a hold of him. And Jesus was trying to teach them that I am your life. I am your hope. You know, faith is in Jesus. Faith isn't the answer, but faith in Jesus is the answer. Hope isn't the answer, but hope in Jesus is the answer. Love isn't the answer. Love in Jesus is the answer because he first loved us. Righteousness in and of itself isn't the answer. Righteousness in Jesus is the answer. Grace isn't the answer. Grace in Jesus is the answer. Life isn't the answer. Life in Jesus is the answer. Jesus is our everything, nothing else, but in Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus said, he says, do you believe this? And she's, you know, they said, we believe, but they didn't really believe. And that's sometimes in our life. We don't really believe. We don't really believe that Jesus is our answer. But he says, I'm going to prove it to you. And he says, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of, the, that was, of him that was dead, saith him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he has been dead for four days. Sometimes Jesus says, stop looking at yourself. Stop being miserable. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop looking at the world. Stop looking at this situation. But roll away the stone and look to me. Open your ears. Put your eyes upon me. But he says, Lord, this area of my life stinks. It's nasty. It's vile. How am I supposed to get bigger? He says, roll it away. Don't hide it from me. He says, I already know it's there. I already know he's dead. I already know he stinks. He says, but roll away the stone. He says, Jesus said unto her, said I unto thee, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And he knew that thou hast hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Sometimes we need to say that. Michael, come forth. Nancy, come forth. Whatever your name is, come forth. Say, in Jesus, I'm coming forth. I hear his voice, his words in front of me. I know the truth. I am coming forth, and I'm looking to Christ to overcome. That's why it says the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. That's why it says be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms, which is the word, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Say, I love you, Lord, and I lift my heart. Lord, my heart belongs to you. My mind belongs to you. My emotions belong to you. My feelings belong to you. My hope belongs to you. My life belongs to you. My money belongs to you. My house belongs to you. My kids belong to you. My, you know, my job belongs to you. Everything I am belongs to you. Therefore, I'm looking to you and not to myself to deal with it. And he says, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. He still, had the, he still had the things wrapped around him. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him and let him go. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to loose you from those things which would bind you. He wants to loose you from the doubt. He wants to loose you from the fear. He wants to loose you from the worry and the anxiety, the anger and the bitterness. He wants to loose you from the past to the, where the past no longer has you bound. He wants to lose you from what happened to you when you were a girl, when you happened to you were a boy, when it happened when you were a child. He wants to heal you, to cleanse you, to set you free, that you can help and heal, that others might be set free. Jesus is the good physician. He wants to heal you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, every area of your life. But who wants to listen to a, a doctor who only wants to deal with your, you know, your, your little wound on your finger when you've almost cut off your foot? And, you know, people listen to a message that, you know, the Lord just wants to save you, but, you know, he doesn't care about that your family split up. He doesn't care about this. He doesn't. Come on. That's not who Jesus is. He wants to set you free. He wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you from the top to the bottom. He wants to save you to the uttermost. And that's why we need to look to Christ because, you know, sometimes we are deceived and we think certain areas of our life are fine. You know, but the Lord wants to set us free from it. How many times have you seen, you know, a little kid, they'll reach for the fireplace, and they think, oh, it's an interesting thing. My father's always messing with it. There's some, it's interesting. But we, you know, you slap their hand and say, no, 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 you ain't touching that fireplace. You ain't running across the road. You ain't doing this. And the little kid's like, why didn't you hit me? You know, sometimes we're that foolish. We're like, Lord, why can't I have that? He's like, if you only knew what you were going to get if you got that. I mean, 
My dad tells a story about how he was walking across of some land many, many years ago. And he, he, you know, he was walking across it, and he says, I really want to buy this land. And the Lord told him, don't. But he says, Lord, I really want to buy it. The Lord said, don't. But he kept at it and kept at it. And the Lord says, okay, you want it. And he bought it, and it brought all kinds of harm to our life. Sometimes we don't listen to the Lord. And we've got to learn to hear the voice of the shepherd. We've got to keep single the eye to fix upon him. We've got to realize that the things of this world don't mean anything, but Christ means everything. And he says, I think I've run out of time here. <laughs> well, the next section is real long, so I can't go on. But, you know, it doesn't really matter who we are. The devil will, he'll come at it from, I mean, he, he, he's, he's had thousands of years to perfect his tricks. I mean, I, I, a small example. I'm riding in the car and I'm meditating on Christ and all of a sudden I'm trying to read the, the tablet, right? The word. I'm trying to read the word, trying to prepare for my sermon and we're going somewhere. And all of a sudden I start feeling road sick. Head, body, you know, ugh. And all of a sudden, after that, he starts hitting your emotions. He starts hitting this. And I mean, it, the little things sometimes that don't seem obvious to us, sometimes they're there. And he'll, instead of saying, Lord, I give you how I feel and I trust in you, well, all of a sudden our mind and our emotions are like, ooh, 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 ooh. And all of a sudden, before you know it, if you don't keep your eyes on Christ, all of a sudden you're getting agitated, you're getting angry, you know, you're getting frustrated. All these things can happen instantly. And we're like, sometimes we're like, What's going on? I know I am. I'm like, I don't understand. Well, it's the devil. The devil, I mean, I mean, have you ever known somebody who could get under your skin in a moment, in a second, and no matter what you did, they always got underneath your skin? Well, that's the devil. The devil knows how to get under our skin. The devil knows how to pull our strings. The devil knows these things. And that's why Jesus says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, he says, you'll produce much fruit. He says, you know, God will keep in perfect peace. His mind stayed on him because he trusts in him. But if our heart and our mind are stayed on anything else, then the devil will take advantage of it. And that's why it's, Jesus says that the prince of this world comes and he can find nothing in me. That's why we need to give ourselves to the Lord because the devil can't find anything in Christ. If we're in Christ and Christ is in us, then the devil can't harm us. But if we're not, then the devil will find something. And the Lord does. He blinds the devil's eyes sometimes to where we don't get what we deserve or we don't get what we could get. But we've got to learn that Christ is our answer. He's the one we look to for our salvation. He's the one we look to for our victory. He's the one we look to our provider. He's the one we look to for our hope. He's the one we look to for joy. He's the one we look to in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, in the middle of the night when you wake up and you're not feeling good, he's the one you look to. And, you know, the devil will hit you and hit you and hit you and hit you. Have you ever read the word and all of a sudden thoughts, feelings, emotions, bam, 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 and you're like, you're, you're like, what's wrong with me? Well, the devil's after you. Take the word of God. Take, look to Jesus. Say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Start singing praise and worship to God. And the devil, you know, Jesus, you know, the devil came against Christ, and he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. Bam, the devil was gone. He says he, could, he couldn't even come back for a portion of time. And that's because Christ was full of his Father, and we're supposed to be full of Christ and his word to where the devil comes out the loser every time he comes against us. Instead of coming and going and saying, ha, ha, I got him, I got her. But our heart and our mind are supposed to be filled with Jesus. Jesus is supposed to be our life and our everything. So I'm just going to end in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your example. We thank you for all you've done, Lord. But Lord, help us to learn, to keep our eyes on you, to keep our heart and our mind stay on you, Lord, to rejoice in you. Lord, help us not to have to go through some of the things we've already gone through. Help us not to have to go over and around that hill again, Lord, but help us to learn that you are our answer. Help us to take everything to you in prayer, Lord. Help us to meditate upon your word, Lord. Help us to... Be like a little child and run to you in every situation and say, Lord, this is wrong, therefore I'm running to you to repent and look to your grace. 
where I'm running to and say, Lord, I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? And it says, come boldly for the throne of grace to find mercy and help in time. He says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of you, Lord. So let us ask of you of wisdom, Lord. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll, he'll lead us. He'll guide us. He'll give us your desires of our heart. So, Lord, help us to look to you, to trust in you, and to abide in you, Father. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.